Focus Forward will begin in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. In 2014, the Wichita Community Foundation partnered with other community organizations to host a speaker series called Feel the Fire. These presentations ignited incredible conversations around issues facing the future of our city. One of these speakers was James Chubb, a Wichita native and president of Reach Advisors, whose profound message resonated deeply with attendees. It's a problem. The Community Foundation knew it was time to move forward. We decided our next strategic initiative would be to engage with James to dig deeper and uncover issues that might be holding our city back. We were encouraged by the potential of this engagement, but we had no idea what the data would reveal. Chung began the process his firm has used for some of the nation's leading businesses, born over demographic and market data, conducting interviews and having difficult conversations with members of the community. In 2015, he shared his diagnosis. This presentation highlighted what many already knew. Wichita was lagging behind its peer cities in almost every single economic category. But Chung didn't just drop the doom and gloom message and leave us to flounder. He laid out four key challenges, human capital, business cycle, entrepreneurship, and perception. These served as a strategic foundation for dialogue and gave us new language as a city. People were challenged by the information presented, sure, but there was also hope excitement, and expectation. The challenges were profound and real, but they were tangible and actionable. We knew the enemy we were facing. The community was ready to face these challenges by uniting resources, time, and expertise to create meaningful change in our city. Good to be back. Thank you for coming. And I understand that there is uh, quite a crowd outside the room as well, too. Um, hello, even if I can't see you. Um, now, of course, we just went through that wonderfully edited video, and now we get to the live part where we don't get to go back and edit out anything. And, um, and of course, I have the biggest challenge of I have to deal with a live audience dealing with the particular challenge of um, taking a look at basically, you know, River Festival hangover. <laughs> but hopefully we'll make this worth it. And although I don't know how many people from that audience is here today. Um, however, if you are, we want to be warm and inclusive and give them a very hearty welcome. <laughs> now, what I didn't realize actually until recently was uh, now that I've been hanging out with some Hawaiian natives that um, this little symbol, this greeting symbol, the surfer symbol is actually from Hawaii called the shaka, which I didn't know. And if I ever picked up the Boston accent, we would be the Wichita State shakas. But um, <laughs> anyway, um, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming out because there are so many people here in the city that really care. And it's because of that that keeps me coming back why I think that this is something that Wichita can do. What we're gonna do is start off with um, a little bit of background on where we are right now. Because we've always felt that one of the most important things we can do is give Wichita a sense of where we really are. Um, it might not always be what we want to know, but it's hard to figure out how we can get better without understanding the baseline. And we were initially asked to come in and talk about community indicators, and we realized we had to get far beyond that and start to figure out what are the areas, most important areas. But as we look at some of the baseline indicators, um, it's easy to see why there's been uncertainty over are we doing okay or not. And taking a look at some of these, you know, some of the things that we'd shown earlier was talking about various measures, and so let's take a look at household economics over the last five years. We see that in Wichita, Income has gone up 7.7%. Home values are up 10.2%. Net worth up 16.5% over the five years. So it feels like it's okay. So that's a sense of the baseline of where we are. And there are 
lots of things happening in Wichita too is there is some good news in motion citywide. So I'm not here for doom and gloom message, which I know some of you fear, but you know, we, we'll talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly as we figure out how we work through this. But there's a lot going on, like this place. This place is pretty remarkable. Um, you know, my family moved here before kindergarten, and I learned to read in one of the branch libraries. I think it was called the Oliver Square branch at the time. My younger brother learned to read in the Fort Rockwell branch. Um, we spent a lot of time in the libraries. Um, this is a fantastic facility. You know, it's a $38 million commitment for the future of Wichita. And there are gonna be hopefully a lot of kids, a lot of families, a lot of individuals who use this and get as much benefit and value out of it as me and my family did. It's the kind of investment we want to see in Wichita. This place is wonderful. It's wonderful to be here. Um, you know, there's a $19 million investment in the arts. There's $70 million commitment downtown on top of a site where I used to work. Um, <laughs> yeah. There's, you know, a billion dollar commitment, um, you know, opening up thousand jobs, very good jobs, high paying jobs that fuel the Wichita economy. Um, you know, look at, you know, 300 plus jobs at Wichita Public Schools, you know, I think that said 71 jobs turned up for Wichita right now. Um, we've got, you know, 177 jobs uh, via Christie. So there are good things happening here as we think about where we are today. Oh, this was a great one. Wichita showing it can play on, you know, on, on the big stage. Um, it was fantastic. So there are indeed good things happening in Wichita. Now the question is, are we on track now? because we hear a lot of talk about the momentum, we've got a lot of things going on here, and there's one message I would like to convey for now, and that is that we're getting a bit better, sort of, but it is not the time to relax. Um, getting comfortable assures no progress. As a matter of fact, I can pretty comfortably state that the most dangerous strategy or position we can take is status quo. Um, and so, we're gonna talk about this and why, we're gonna talk about why we can assure comfort or relaxation or complacency will assure no progress as we take a look at a lot of the macro indicators. So right now we have a little bit of a break with a little bit more background. In 2016, about 18 months after his first presentation, Chung returned to share an update on how Wichita was performing, unfortunately. When he presented his findings with the Wichita Community Foundation, it was apparent that the latest data wasn't going to be as positive or show as much improvement as hoped. It's making it harder for Wichita businesses to grow here. It seemed that despite Wichita's efforts, little had changed. Eager to highlight the progress that had been made, the message wasn't as hard-hitting as the diagnosis. We may have been too soft with the second round of presentations. We knew the perception of our city had shifted. We knew the efforts that had been made, and we didn't want to downplay them. But as we celebrated the good that had been done, we may not have accurately communicated the reality of the situation. Even still, there were community leaders who felt that Chung was too hard on Wichita. He headed back to Boston, knowing that the insights had not resonated with quite the same impact as his diagnosis. It was never the goal of Focus 4 to beat up on Wichita. Rather, the Wichita Community Foundation wanted to provide the resources necessary to put the data on the table and create the space for collective, collaborative, and actionable conversations. All right, of course they had to use the video with all my frowny faces and all in that one. <laughs> but the reason why that was important to set up is that I realized that second presentation when we came around, um, we tried to sh capture some of the good things that were moving forward, some of the momentum that was happening after our first round of presentations. And as I was walking out of the room, there was someone I'd gotten to know through this process who said, you know, I'm really glad I came. I was a little bit, of, we didn't know what to expect, fearing more doom and gloom, but it seems like things are moving forward so I can relax now. It seems like things are on track and I realized I failed. <laughs> totally flat out failed in that. So, what I want to do at this point is talk a little bit about where we are part two. So we have a better understanding of the issues that we're grappling with, why they're so serious. And as we look at where we are right now, 
there are some things that we just have to accept as part of the challenge. As we look at various measures, and we have much better data now to be able to understand what's happening, basically, you know, the regional gross domestic product or gross regional product for Wichita, we're in a no-growth economy. It's official. We're in a no-growth economy. Looking back, comparing to where we were in 2010. And so now, how does that make sense? My first slide said income is up, you know, house values are up, um, net worth is up, but the regional economy is flat. Well, what's happening is this is indexed to 2010. Um, the prior slide um, basically reflects the gains were purely because of inflation. Actually, they didn't even keep up with inflation. So the average income, average home value, average net worth has decreased in Wichita. But it's not just a no growth scenario, um, it's actually a negative decade. We're down 1% since 2010. Um, this is officially a recession. We are still in a recession as a city. This is where we were. But a lot of people are asking, well, is it because of our geography? Is it because we're a manufacturing city? You know, what explains why we are in a no growth economy or a negative economy? Um, and, uh, you know, here's one thing we have to understand is that we're in a context of immense growth right now. Uh, the nation has been rebounding significantly since 2010. We're down a 16% gap. So we can't really be comfortable that we're flat. We're actually losing 16% ground versus the rest of the country. And as we think about, well, is it because of where we are? Is it because of a composition of our, of our employment or geography? Um, if we take a look at every single central U.S. city between 500,000 and a million people, every single one of them is performing better than the national economy. There are only about 20% of, uh, of American cities are negative growth since 2010. Actually, it's less than 20%. We're in that range. What makes it even tougher is 80% of those, 80 plus percent of those are tiny cities compared to us. There are only a handful of cities left that are in our situation. Um, as we think about all the variables that we look at, it's not because we're a manufacturing city, it's not because of our geography, it's not because of our size. The only variable left is Wichita. The things that make Wichita so unique are proving to be holding the Wichita economy back. We just have to confront that head on. We have to accept it. We have to decide, are we willing to accept the Wichita that we know and the Wichita that in, which, in which we're expected to operate? Or are we going to create the new Wichita that can operate like all of our comp cities that are doing better than the rest of the country? Um, the market has clearly spoken. The market has clearly given us all the signals that how we operate as a city does not work economically. It's crystal clear. I hate to say it. We collectively as a city, you're going to have to decide, are we going to just accept the way we operate? Or are we going to create a better Wichita? That's the ultimate question on the table today. I hate to be that blunt, but that's what we're dealing with. Um, so one question is, why is the rest of the country growing except for Wichita? And so we try to deconstruct some of this. And for a lot of people, one of the top questions that comes to mind is, um, you know, well, what about, well, in an earlier presentation, we had talked about the concept of alphas and betas. And I know it's a little bit confusing because it borrows from financial portfolio theory um, that we've been doing extensive. We started pioneering this work actually back in Wichita in 2015 have taken it so much further. But one way to think about it is in the financial world, alpha is a level of over risk adjusted and cyclically, cyclically adjusted overperformance. In other words, if the economy is going like this, if a, if a company or a city can outperform the norm consistently through the cycles, that's alpha. In the investment world, you hunt for alpha. That is what you're aiming for. Beta is 
you know, amidst ups and downs in the economy, beta is, are you more variable than the rest of the economy? Now, unfortunately, Wichita is a, not just a low alpha, but a negative alpha economy and a high beta economy. We'll explain this. I'll use a couple of examples. Here's an example from Omaha. And um, so since we started pioneering this work in 2015, I've since uh, spun out a new data science firm that can actually calculate alphas and betas and all sorts of crazy local statistics. Basically, when we can release, we can front run and pre-release governmental data now. Um, and so let, we'll use the example of Omaha. Omaha is a moderate growth, moderate volatility metro. Alpha is 0.2, so low alpha but positive. And then beta is 0.92, which means it's 8% less cyclical than the rest of the economy. So basically, if the economy grows 1%, Omaha grows 1.1%. Because there's higher alpha, lower variability, it'll consistently outperform the economy. Let's compare that to Wichita. Wichita is a low growth, high volatility metro. This is not my subjective judgment. These are extremely complex machines that are ingesting 200 governmental, couple hundred governmental data sources and figuring this out. And we have an alpha of minus 0.2. So in other words, we will always underperform the US economy by about 2%, except beta can create a recovery because we're more cyclical. We're 1.16 we're uh, beta, 16% more cyclical than the rest of the US. So we theoretically should be able to outperform in strong periods. We'll all, always lag the, the US economy, but we can recover faster. But let's take a look at what's really happening. And I'll show this through the lens of a community where I'm spending a ton of time right now um, building a new city in Orange County, California. Um, Orange County is also a negative alpha, you know, moderately low growth, high, high volatility county. Alpha is also negative, 0.3. Um, beta, 13%, high beta. So here's what happens in a negative alpha, high beta community. So for Orange County, that is the orange line, basically. Um, before the big crash, we had faster growth because it's high beta. It's more cyclical than the US. After the crash, steeper decline. And then post the cr post crash, basically closing the gap. That's what happens in a negative alpha, high beta economy. And I apologize. I hope I'm trying to bring the audience along. Um, but it's sort of complex. But it's a really been helpful format to understand local economies. If the economy continues to rebound over the next couple of years, Orange County will actually exceed the rest of the US. Um, it's why in Orange County we can build 15,000 homes, new homes, and build a new city. Because we understand how to manage and navigate alpha and beta. Now, Wichita is also negative alpha and high beta, but here's what happens. Wichita is a blue line. Basically, we saw a bit of a higher beta rebound in the early 2000s. Slightly higher than the US, um, but it couldn't sustain it. During the recession, there was a much steeper decline. But notice what's happened. There's been no gain since 2010. We're lagging the rest of the US economy more than ever because we have such high negative beta in the market. My clients are in the hunt for hidden alpha and how to navigate beta. Um, that's how investment firms make money. Um, looking for alpha. Wichita has lost alpha we have to figure out what we can do about this. So we're gonna go into three root causes for negative alpha. What are the fundamental things, and they're very tightly, tightly uh, tied to the four challenges we've laid out before. But we're boiling down to three root causes. If we had to pick apart what explains why Wichita's in the situation is in, if there are just three things that we can get Wichita to really think about, and think about if it's ready to redefine how Wichita operates on these things. If it does, Wichita will be okay. But it's gonna take Wichita to step up to the table. Oh wait, before you turn off the lights, there's one more section. Um, I know I'm talking about a lot of this macroeconomic stuff applied at a local level. And the question is, does the macro matter? Here's why it matters. There's a cost to a negative alpha economy. It's not just to a city but it's personal. 
and this is what it would look like if we were in a city that just operated like a normal mid-sized Midwestern city. This is the cost. Most central U.S. mid-sized comps, our average incomes would be $10,000 higher if we just operated at the same level as our comps. Our average home price would be $50,000 more. I got to say, I'm tired of hearing that one of the selling benefits of Wichita is low home prices. What that means is there's more supply than demand for your home. And it means that homeowners aren't building wealth. Um, average net worth in an a typical central U.S. mid-sized comp city, average net worth would be $130,000. That sends kids to college. This is serious money. This is what we're holding ourselves back from by choosing to accept the path that Wichita is on now and choosing to accept how Wichita operates now. We can accept it and say that's just the way it is, and this is the current cost, and the gap's only going to go further or we can do something about it. And so three root causes. Um, first one is we have this abnormally constrained labor market for the city of our size, which we're just about to talk about. But let's switch gears a little bit before we go into this. There's significant work to be done to advance Wichita's labor force but there are people that are monumentally important to the future of Wichita. We need to amplify activities like the ones you're about to hear at scale. I came to Wichita as a baby. I left after college for a while and then came back when it was time for me to raise my family. Um, I've always been innovative, so as president and CEO of Wichita Technology Corporation, I now co-chair the Entrepreneurship Task Force, which is a group that assists entrepreneurs and startups. Together, we have created Wichita's first accelerator, E2E. -E. I'm Trish Braisted, and I'm a Wichita. I moved from Colorado to Wichita when I was given the opportunity to advance my career skills at uh, WSU Tech through the Wichita, Scholar Wichita Promise Scholarship Program. I uh, started eight weeks ago. Uh, I've now completed my training, and uh, last week I was offered a position as a sheet metal mechanic at Spear Aero Systems. My name is Zach Meitzel. Zach, thanks for coming. We need a lot more like you. Trish, thanks for everything you do. We realize that uh, so much of what you do is uncompensated. You're doing it for the good of Wichita, and we hope in turn it compensates you well for what you're doing with ventures. We need more of this kind of activity. It's not about one single bullet in one single area. We need a lot more. One of the things that sets Wichita apart from other cities is it's pretty effective at saying no to things. <laughs> we need to start being able to say yes to things like I hear in our comp cities. Um, this labor issue is really important because we've got this really weird labor market phenomenon in Wichita, which we do not see in many other cities. There are open jobs. We are in a hot economy. The U.S. labor force is growing significantly, but not in Wichita. Yeah, we have lower unemployment rate, but that's not what, sh what we should be heralding. We have lower unemployment rate because more people are leaving town. That's what's driving our reduction of, the, of employment, unemployment rate. We have a whacked labor economy that we do not see in any healthy city in America. There are structural challenges here that we're creating upon ourselves that we have to figure out how to break open the log jams. Otherwise, we can't grow with that kind of phenomena. And why do, wh why do we have to work so hard to be different as a city? Why don't we just raise, you know, r ride the wave of what's happening out, out uh, in the economy? So is it manufacturing? That's what I keep hearing. It's a manufacturing city. But the, of all the mid-sized cities where manufacturing is the number one industry, all of them are growing manufacturing growth in the last five years, except Wichita. Of all of the mid-sized cities where manufacturing is the number one industry, 
all of them are growing wages significantly, except Wichita. Growing the manufacturing economy simply has not been as tough as elsewhere. We need to find a way to accelerate. You know, how do we make Wichita a better place for the Zacks to come and say, this is a city of opportunity? Um, they're good jobs. How do, we, how do we create more of this kind of environment, these kind of jobs, those kinds of employers? But it's not just manufacturing. The broader workforce in Wichita is also very different than the rest of the country as well, too. And as we talk about that, let's compare it to Des Moines, where total populations are about equal. Now, of course, when I started these presentations in 2015, I said, Wichita is bigger than Des Moines. You know, Des, Mo no, Des Moines is a smaller city than Wichita. Um, the slide says equal, but they passed us last year, guys. You know, but there's still 19,000 more adults in Wichita. Um, and the reason why is that um, Des Moines truly is a family-friendly city, and they're a magnet for families moving back to Des Moines. So therefore, they have more children, we have more adults. Um, by every economic measure, I hate to say, I know Wichita said one of his assets is family-friendly. By every economic measure, Des Moines beats us. Um, so we have more adults than they do. Uh, but despite the fact that we have more adults, we have 19,000 more adults, but 17,000 fewer people in the labor force. So this is what I mean by an artificially constrained economy. We don't have the labor force that most economies, most cities of our size should have to be effective communities. And then let's pick this apart a little bit further. Um, we, we're not just 17,000 people smaller. When we compare college educated workers, we're 26,000 fewer. We leak college talent fast. Faster, and this is in the landscape of, there's been a dramatic, in th there's been continued increase in college educational attainment. Economies shouldn't be losing college workforce when the number is actually growing. There's something about Wichita where, for some reason, we create an environment where we're losing talent. We're not able to attract talent at all levels, so we're left with the constrained workforce. Now, new college grads haven't been filling the bucket. So most of the new graduates that come to Wichita come from three universities. As we take a look at the patterns of the three universities, um, half of Wichita State grads leave Wichita. And it's understandable. They're, not everyone's going to stay. And Wichita is producing good talent. Um, Wichita, Kansas tends to be a feeder for Denver, LA, Phoenix, Dallas, and Houston, and Kansas City. Those are the big feeder markets. Um, S Wichita has Wichita State actually feeds Seattle fairly decently because you know in part maybe Boeing but in part you know there have also been departments at Wichita State that are producing massive talent incredible national caliber talent going to places like Microsoft. Of course, we lost that department last year. Um, no one even really knew about them or knew that we lost them. But we would have loved we should have scaled that department and fed those kinds of people that are feeding those employers and have them working here. We need to start thinking a lot more aggressively about how we end up growing talent, fostering talent, harnessing talent in Wichita. Um, K-State um, has those markets, not Seattle, but all those markets, then also has East Coast distribution. I'm gonna have people guess. So Wichita, the Wichita metro area is 23% of, uh, of the population in the state of Kansas. What percentage of uh, K-State grads come to Wichita? Guesses? So if you hear people saying 20, yeah. So we're 23% of the state, 7.6% come to Wichita. Um, KU, 3.6%. They're voting. This is a vote on what people think about their potential in Wichita. Um, we have a ton of fantastic talent that we're cultivating and we're exporting it without being able to capture any value from it. But they're here. And so we have to think about like what we're doing. Um, so we have to think about what we're doing and why we are creating an environment where we're creating an unattractive environment for college you know, graduates or college graduates in the workforce. Um, 
Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the impact of the constrained labor market. And right now, the overflow room actually has a much better view since we don't have the screens up in this room. <laughs> but here's why a constrained labor market matters. Because we have a artificially constrained, we, we have constraints that other markets our size don't have. And because of that, there are three consequences. Number one is it's harder for Wichita businesses to grow here because the labor pool isn't as plentiful as it could be. It also explains a lot of the challenges we have on attracting new businesses. What's the number one thing that they want when they're looking? It's not about the number one issue for them is not about level of tax breaks. It's not about tax rate. It's about, and because taxes are only about 120th payroll, it's about the caliber of the talent. And so this is what the constraint means to us. And then it's also harder for ventures to grow here because we don't have, we're not keeping, we're not attracting the kind of talent in the quantities where it makes it easier to form teams and do that. So there's a cost and a consequence to these outcomes, which we'll pick apart. This will be the first piece of picking that apart. From 2015, we laid out a information on migration, net domestic migration. Um, Wichita lost 12,000 people uh, between 2010 and 2014. But Wichita is the only city among our peers that lost population. Um, in measuring net domestic migration, number of newcomers versus number of departures, Wichita was the 331st city out of the 381 metro areas in America. Um, we are one of the few net migration lost cities out there. Now let's update the data to where we are now. Where we are now is that all the other cities have grown at even a faster rate. Wichita has lost population at even a faster rate. So now we're the 346th ranked city on net domestic migration out of 300 metro areas. We're basically becoming, a, in terms of productivity, performance, bottom 15% on that measure. But it's not the only measure where we're continuing to slide, where we keep seeing indication after indication where we started, and on many measures, we're about a bottom quartile city, bottom 25%. When we came back, we're about a bottom 20% city. Now we're about a bottom 15% city. Um, I don't want to come back and say we're a bottom 10% city on a lot of these measures. Please don't make me do that. Um, but that's up to Wichita now to think about how to tackle it. Now picking this apart further about where this migration challenge is happening, we're able to start to pick apart where the disproportionate number of departures are. And basically, college women, educated women under the age of 45 is one of the areas where we're losing population. And minorities with associate's degrees or bachelor's degrees. Now, this is actually a hard number to calculate because we have so few in the first place but it's where we have disproportionate losses. Um, for college-educated women, there may be a reason why. Um, we released data earlier where basically for almost every segment of women in the workforce, there is a pay gap. It happens across the country except for one segment that we found. But um, the gap is even bigger in Wichita than, any, than almost any other city. There's an economic consequence to working here. Um, it's easy to see why there's greater loss. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on the data on these two points, these two audiences, but I do ask for us to at least sit back and think about what is it about the Wichita environment where this is the market we lost at a greater rate. This is a big of the explanatory factor while we have an abnormally constrained labor market. Um, and this leads to the next question, and that is root cause number two. There's a challenged attitudinal and perceptional environment that really is worth strengthening. Um, we've laid out perception issues, but it goes deeper than that. And let's take a break and reconvene in a bit. Though Wichita struggles with inclusiveness, we're not without examples of it in action. Remember when the Wichita Police Department and Black Lives Matter activists hosted the First Steps Cookout? They turned tension into dialogue. You're about to hear from a few other people who have seen what inclusiveness can do for our community. I'm 
moved here in 2010 to be the uh, general manager of Entrust Bank Arena. I've never seen such stronger community collaboration than what occurred this past March when we hosted the first and second round of the NCAA tournament. And I have no doubt we're going to do it even better again in 2021. My name is AJ Bolesky, and I'm a Wichita. I moved here 28 years ago. I am the National Educator of the Year for GLSEN, the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Educational Network. When Westboro Baptist showed up at North High School, where I've taught band and orchestra for the last 27 years, and protested us, our student body, my school family, papered our campus in rainbow colors. Love Trump's hate. I'm Stephanie Byers, and I'm a Wichita. Hello. I'm a double boomeranger, and that means I was born here, but I left twice and I moved back twice. I am proud to be part of the two-person team that manages the Wichita Flag social media accounts and the I Love Wichita movement. Every day we post content, share things that Wichitans, very creative Wichitans from around the world are sharing with us. I'm also proud to be part of the Chambers team where we work every day to advance the business community and the region. I'm Angie Prather, and I'm a Wichita. AJ, thanks for raising the bar on the city. Uh, Wichita showed it can play on the national stage, it can play the big game. And you pulled out a really key point. It's because there was a greater level of collaboration that was remarkable, that delivered incredible results. Um, I loved riding in from the airport with the Lyft driver who told me that he was, he was uh, driving one of the NCAA representatives who said this city was incredible in what it delivered. Um, but you just set the bar and took it up another notch. Um, but it's because of collaboration. We showed that we could work in a different way than we had before. Stephanie, thank you for being in Wichita. Um, one of the things that you mentioned earlier is 2,400 students showed up. 2,400. This is one of the things we have to understand that I understand why there might be different viewpoints on different issues, but as we think about that talent chokehold that we have, we have to understand there's a different, there's a generation that thinks differently than a lot of, a lot of us out there. Um, if we want that new generation in here, we probably have to accept that they may think differently, they may have different attitudes, we have to embrace them, we have to embrace their attitudes if we're going to grow and bring talent in. Thank you for what you do. Um, Angie, um, wicked cool, I, this is uh, uh, a, lot of, a, a lot of things have happened in Wichita that we've seen just like wonderful uh, movement, uh, a city that sort of decided it's okay to be proud of this city. Um, it embraced that, um, you know, it wears Wichita proudly, um, sometimes literally, but um, <laughs> it shows that when Wichita decides to move, it can move. And the good news behind that is there are some perception issues that have changed since we started on this. One of the pieces of data that we collected is we went in the field of survey and uh, we surveyed Wichita and other Midwestern cities, and there was a piece of data that just frightened us about sharing last time, but I'm not sure it really sunk in. And that is that in 2016, we asked whether people absolutely want to stay in their city or would love to leave if they could. The results were frightening. Um, Midwestern cities, many more people absolutely want to stay. In Wichita, more people would love to leave. That was frightening, and I'm not sure. We probably had played a little bit of a role in Wichita not taking this seriously enough because we try to hide it a little bit by saying, well, there was one population in particular, you know, um, but one age group, but pretty much, well, every age category felt this way. Um, this is not what makes a city that works, but we replicated this and found basically it's okay to be like a typical Midwestern city we're, we're there now. Um, we're, we're, we've gone out, we've, we've exited sort of the much greater level of bleakness in 2016. 
Wichita is a little bit more proud of Wichita, more proud to be in Wichita. That's a significant improvement. We know we can do things when we put our heads down and some good things click together. Um, this is a massive improvement. 2016 was frightening. 2018, we're good. Um, we're you know, not complacent, but um, it's, it's good to be in the league of other cities like ours now. Another way that reflects is more optimistic. Um, only 20% were optimistic in 2016 about the future of the city. That's frightening. Um, we've almost doubled that, 36% uh, now. Um, so that's fantastic. We've nearly doubled it. Uh, there, we have moved the needle. Wichita has done a great job at changing internal perception. But 36% ain't the bar, guys. Um, we need to crank it up further. Um, but there are also challenging perceptions to tackle. Um, there's one in particular that I'm going to flag because it relates to that last section that we had about the abnormal constraint, uh, abnormally constrained labor market. Um, we sensed that there was a little bit of a challenge when we started coming to Wichita. Um, I've never been in a city where people are so willing proactively to talk negatively about the higher education institutions and about higher education in general. And I turned to one of my colleagues in the Wichita Community Foundation and said, I hope I don't keep hearing this because this is un this unusually um, prevalent here. So we actually went into the uh, survey compared to a national sample of uh, is college educational extremely important or important for, for a young person to succeed in the world today? Most Americans say, yeah, college is extremely or very important. Which not only 54% agree with that. Um, there's another question that we compared to a national sample as well too. Are colleges and universities having a positive or negative effect on the way things are going in the country these days? The majority of Americans agree. Only a third of Wichita does. And here's what really ticks me off about Wichita. What I don't think Wichita fully realizes is if it weren't for the innovation and the thinking of the higher education at institutions in Wichita, we wouldn't even be in the game anymore. Let's take a look at some of what's happening there. You know, Wichita State has been doing a remarkable job at bringing advanced technologies in where students can have access to it, develop skills and experience that launch them into high paying jobs. Unfortunately, as Wichita, we choose to export that talent for them, you know, a lot of that talent. But they continue to head on that path. Um, another example of this is the, uh, what the, is it, the, if I get the name right, Institute for Interdisciplinary Innovation and the Masters of Innovation Design Program. Just returned from a competition where, sponsored by Johnson Johnson, that told them that they were among the very best programs in the world at innovation design. We have world-class talent that we're developing here that we're developing and helping them develop their skills for where the economy is heading. It happens here. Take a look at what's happening with, you know, Wichita Area Technical College, now WSU Tech, thinking very creatively about how do we create more and different pathways for people to gain additional levels of education and skills to bring them to higher, better value, higher to better use. Take a look at Friends University. Um, well, actually, I skipped a slide. Um, Newman came to realize that there's one job category, one, one job class where we know jobs are going to grow. It's in healthcare services. That's pretty much guaranteed. So they were willing to step out and say, we're going to commit to building amazing facilities for those students to bring them better levels of education, advanced knowledge. We're going to go raise money for this. They're preparing, work, they're preparing college students for where the economy is heading. Friends establishing the Intrust Cybersecurity Lab. Um, even though that just started, that lab will likely, I will bet, probably double the incomes of the students between the time they start and the time they finish. Um, a lot of these programs have met either 
non-support from Wichita or even resistance in a lot of ways. But they shouldn't because that's what's keeping us in the game. And I'm going to issue a little bit of a challenge. I know that there are people here who are attending who have some of the sen sentiments that we flagged earlier that I have to admit, I might not agree with how you feel, but it's in part because I don't have to live within the economic consequences of that. But I can respect the position that you have, but I'm going to ask one thing of you, though, one favor, and that is before you leave, if you could do me a favor, talk to someone from one of the universities and ask them what they're doing. Just chat about it. Not asking to change your mind, but just have that conversation. Um, so, Rick Muma, Wichita State. Um, uh, Sherry Utash, WSU Tech. Um, is Amy Carey from Friends here? Amy Carey, Friends. Um, Noreen Karochi, are you around today? Thank you. Newman, um, please don't leave without having a conversation. There are amazing things happening here. And I don't want Wichita to be a city that chokes off this kind of talent, that creates an atmosphere and environment where we're shrinking our labor force. There are economic consequences to that. I want us to be more open about that and more open to that kind of talent. And fundamentally, I'm going to ask another question. There are others who already get this and buy into it. I'm going to ask, is Wichita ready to step up support for even more educational innovation? The economy is changing rapidly, wicked rapidly. Um, these things don't happen automatically. Uh, some of the universities have to go out on a limb to launch some of these programs. There are costs associated with that. I would like more people to think, you know, even if you haven't raised money to be, you know, earned enough money to be a donor, is there a place, come find these people. Talk about, you know, is there a place where you can either participate, support, connect people, or donate? Is Wichita ready to step up the plate? And part of the reason why I raise this point is because of a third root cause. And that is, by all measures, Wichita suffers from chronic underinvestment compared to cities this size. By almost every measure, every category, we'll look at it. We're not only choking ourselves with the stranglehold that we create to create an abnormally small labor force for a functioning market. Um, it's a city that loves to starve itself compared to other cities like ours. It's a problem. We're going to have to address it. It's been three years since the inception of Focus Forward. Rather than continue to present additional data year after year, the Wichita Community Foundation and Sean both know it's time for the next step. There's still more work to do, a lot more. In conversations leading up to tonight, we wanted to honor those that have raised their hands to experiment with ways to tackle the challenges. But it would be a mistake to not acknowledge the reality of the situation in which we find ourselves. Tonight is not a celebration. It's not a pep rally for the great things we've achieved. It's not a time for us to high five and cheers to our mission being accomplished. Tonight is an exhortation. As Focus Fort evolves, the real work begins. All right. Do we want to bring up some others to comment about this? Okay. okay. Um, so going back to this issue of uh, chronic underinvestment, it's happening in every category we look at. And we do have to step back and look at ourselves and say, are we willing to accept this? Or is this part of how we re redefine what Wichita is going to be? So let's take a look at, for example, um, civic it's and public It's been three investment. years since the inception of Focus Forward. Rather than continue to. All right. Let's take a look at the category of civic and public investment. Um, so we have some good things going on. For example, we flag in downtown, there's about $40 million of civic investment going on, civic development going on right now. And it's a good thing. Um, we need to see more of this. But to put this in context, um, 
you know, we will probably, it may be a difficult city to do something like, you know, Oklahoma City is in their third MAPS plan, um, $575 million that's uh, publicly financing various advancements. Some of the prior ones have been over a billion. We might not have that size of capital, but for example, in our comp cities, our size, um, cities very much like Wichita, it's $200 million that's going into civic investment. Um, we need to figure out their ways to step this up. Let's take a look at private sector driven investment in a bunch of categories. Um, take a look at venture capital, for example. Um, in the past two years, uh, probably one of the better data sources has tracked five deals, $5.4 million invested in venture capital. Um, we're talking about seed stage, early stage capital to see if some of them, not all of them will make it, but if some of them can grow into companies that create significant enterprise value. Um, let's compare to some other cities. You know, Omaha, which is only about uh, 250,000 more people, 15 track deals, 20 million. Des Moines, same size as Wichita, 23 track deals, $130 million of venture capital flowing in that market. It's not just those. Uh, Fayetteville, which is one of our comps, um, $93 million. Um, you know, the only other mid-sized city that is negative has numbers that look a little bit more like Wichita. Um, that's one example of private sector driven investment. So we've had this conversation before is that we realize that, uh, that it might be hard to generate the level of support that's happening outside the private sector uh, that's happening in other cities, which can be okay if we have private sector investment, but if that's the solution, we need private sector investment to step up as well too. Um, let's take a look at the downtown development, the hotel category. Got $14 million going in right now. Hilton Garden Inn on Douglas, great. But to give you a sense of, uh, in one of our comp cities, they've got $200 million of hotel development going in downtown. Another comp city, $300 million of devel hotel development going on. Uh, downtown residential development, uh, it was wonderful to see what's happening on the river now. So in total, it's somewhere under $100 million of uh, residential development now. In our comp cities, um, our, our comp that's almost identical, it's $500 million of residential development. In another one of our comps that isn't uh, too much bigger, $2.5 billion of residential development. Um, take commercial, got uh, somewhere under $200 million going in. Um, in, you know, it's $500 million in our closest comp, a billion in one that's just slightly larger. Um, we just aren't, what's happening here in a lot of ways goes back to that alpha and beta thing. Basically, these are economies that are reinvesting as the economy is strong. Um, you know, what happened in a lot of these communities is that, um, oh, we've actually, Let's go to mega projects. Um, billion dollars we're very happy about being invested in Wichita. Um, but in other mid-sized markets, there are multiple billion dollar projects. This is just one of them. There's another one that has this kind of record of multiple billion dollar uh, mega projects. Um, what's happening on that front is that basically they are, re or if there's a common theme about our comp cities, all of them doing better in Wichita, because everyone's always asking, what are they doing that we can do? The common theme isn't that they, there is a silver bullet. Wichita loves hunting for the silver bullet. You know, it's just, please tell us the thing to do, or, you know, it's just a matter of, you know, it's a legislative policy, fiscal policy issue that's the silver bullet. It's not. It just flat out isn't. Um, each of these cities have had different paths, different strategies, some of them opposing different, uh, diff it, it doesn't matter. What they did have, so in other words, it's not a structure they've created, it's not a piece of legislation, it's not, um, you know, the, a plan, even though the leaders of those cities will say it's their organization and plan because they did them, it wasn't. There's a lot of things that they did in their plan that we would never have recommended because we know that it would deliver suboptimal outcomes based on what we do in our other work. But what they did was, there was a point in time they realized, typically in a recession or after a crisis, that we need to pull together as a city. We need to start collaborating. We need to figure out how to make things work. They all had different plans, different paths, 
different solutions, they all pulled forward. Um, I, don't Wichita, I don't want Wichita to keep waiting for the catastrophe until it can do that. Um, the catastrophe is now, we're one of the only cities in America that's still left in a recession. If we can't take advantage of that, or as the mayor of Oklahoma City told me, um, you know, basically, if Wichita didn't realize Boeing's departure was, you know, was, was, was the crisis, they blew it. Um, we have that level of challenge and crisis now. And the question is, can we pull together as a city to operate differently than we have because the market has clearly said that the current way we operate doesn't work. It's that flat out simple. So taking a look at another category, um, community philanthropic investment. On this front, um, I'm happy to say the Wichita Community Foundation has grown since this process has started from $70 million to $80 million of assets under management, which is a good thing. Um, the, but looking at a bigger context, if we compare them to other cities, as just a proxy of philanthropic investment. It's not, of course, not the entirety of philanthropic investment, but Cedar Rapids is twice the size. Cedar Rapids is one third the size of Wichita, but they invest, invested twice as much in, in their community foundation. Uh, Grand Rapids didn't hit our comp city because they're a little bit over a million, but they have $331 million. Um, what I find really interesting in Grand Rapids is Grand Rapids is probably Wichita's closest political peer um, in terms of attitudes and so forth. But what I find really interesting about Grand Rapids is, like some of the other cities we're about to see, one sentiment is, if you made money here, you reinvest here. And the next two cities definitely have that attitude. There's another thing they say in Grand Rapids, too, that really caught my attention. And they say, I may disagree with you on a lot of things, but when it comes to good for the city, I'm willing to put that aside and get things done. I'm not sure I've had, heard that language here. Des Moines, same size city. Uh, significant difference. Uh, Omaha, not much larger, massive difference. These are cities that say that their language is you make money here, you reinvest it here. It's not about starving a city. It's also cities where they're willing to say, um, you know, if there's a good idea, we're going to find a way to get it done. Once again, we've got to be the city that starts to say yes instead of the city that says no. Okay, so just recapping. Um, okay. It's time for far more aggressive investment by the private sector, for venture development, and in civic activity if Wichita wants to see progress. We need to see a much deeper flow of people and organizations investing and deploying capital to advance current initiatives, just like the examples you're about to hear. I've lived in Wichita since I was eight years old. These days, I help develop marketing strategies for Fidelity Bank, owned by the Bastion family. The Bastions have long supported the Wichita community through initiatives like the Chung Report and the Bravely Onward Fund. I'm proud to play a behind-the-scenes role. My name is John DeCesaro, and I'm a Wichita. My father's family has lived here since the 1900s, and I came here in 1970. To some of you, I'm known as the chairman of the Library Foundation, and we were very happy to work with the city to build the building that we're in today. It will benefit generations to come. My name is John Berry, and I'm a Wichita. I moved to Wichita in 2005 to be near family. I had only visited the city once before making the decision. 13 years later, I am now a member of staff with WSU's Public Policy and Management Center. We just completed conducting focus groups for Project Wichita, which is a community engagement effort. 
There are over 90 organizations involved. We had over 3,800 participants in the focus groups and have raised over $500,000 for this effort. I am proud to be a part of casting the vision for our community. I am LaShonda Garns, and I am proud to be a Wichita. LaShonda, I know how much time you're pouring into this stuff, and if it weren't for so many people in Wichita that were doing this, I would be frightful about what's happening, but we do have a ton of people who care about this city, and we need as many people to step up to do that because it is time. Um, John, what I found really interesting is that uh, there's a lot that has been done that you guys aren't waiting around. You guys are saying, I hear you. We're going to start moving. Um, you know, including that surprise when you said, guess what? We're doing the Chung Report. Uh, are you okay with it? <laughs> um, <laughs> And, um, you know, it's just, you, get, you just do stuff. Um, that's one of the themes that's happening in other cities. Don, same story with you. I remember, I think it was after one of the presentations, you came up, you handed me your card, you said, I'm Don Barry, if there is anything I can do, give me a call. And I think you walked away. But that was, a, that, that just let me know. And you walked away. But you didn't wait for the call. You decided, let's get this thing done. Um, and you brought a lot of others with you. That's what we need to start thinking about is how do we start to get off the fence and start moving this ball forward? Um, because Wichita is a city that says no, it's part of the reason why I'm not telling you what to do because I know what the response is going to be. <laughs> but there's, yeah, it's not like a corporate client where I can, you know, and, you know, and, uh, uh, but there are lots of things that need to get done here. Um, don't wait around. Don't just say, well, I can't do anything about it. Um, you know, if you, for example, I mean, think about of these issues you're hearing, is there a place you can have a point of impact? Is there an organization that you can help? Um, if you have the financial means, are there things you can say yes, where you can say yes to a good idea? Um, if you have the means but you don't know what to support, um, one of the things I've learned through this process, and Shelley and Clark did not put me up to any of this. They didn't even know I was going to have some of those slides up there. But um, one of my firms serves a lot of the most sophisticated real estate financial funds in the world that are basically hunting for hidden alpha. That's the whole, that's why they pay for all extreme data science. Um, they're trying to figure out where is the alpha. Um, unfortunately, in Wichita, we've sucked a lot of the alpha out of the economy. But, and quite frankly, we're a pretty good, we used to be a good city at managing beta. So in other words, a lot of people think their success is because of alpha. It's actually because of beta. You know, they're successful in, in good times. Um, and um, we work with a lot of folks who are hunting for alpha. And we've done a good job at suppressing alpha in this economy. But one of the things I've learned about this is that the Wichita Community Foundation does a phenomenal job at trying to hunt for alpha in Wichita, try to figure out how do you deploy capital to higher impact. And part of the reason why that happened, as I heard the story is, before this whole process started, the Community Foundation was trying to think through why is it that, you know, what are we doing, how are we doing, and they realized that the granting strategy, they were trying to give grants to whatever made sense and disperse it across Wichita, and they're willing to step back and realize we're not having impact. They're willing to accept we might not be succeeding. That was a pretty big, bold step for them to step up and say, what can we do to find better levers to drive higher impact in Wichita? So. One lesson of that is it's okay to admit failure and figure out how you channel that into something of higher and better use like they did. The other thing is if you don't know where to park money, this is an organization that's doing a freaking phenomenal job, better than any of the community, community foundations I've spoken with <laughs> at figuring out how to amplify what they do. 
And there are lots of places like this. So let's just recap. Why hasn't Wichita recovered economically yet? Why is Wichita in the state it is? It's high negative alpha. I hate to admit it, but that's what it comes down to. Um, we are sucking the alpha out of this economy because of three root causes. Abnormally constrained labor market for the city of its size. Challenged attitudinal and perceptual environment that's worth strengthening and chronic underinvestment compared to cities of this size. And we as a city now just have to ask ourselves, are we willing to accept what we, how we operate? Are we willing to accept that? Are we willing to live with that? You know, or we realize the issues are known, the issues are addressable, and almost all of our comp cities have succeeded and almost, we're one of the few cities left. It's not working. But can we invent the new Wichita? It's now time, in the sense that it's now time for Wichita to make that decision, and it's now time for Wichita to start moving. Please don't make me come back without having made that decision, because I can tell you what I will be have to share. Um, please prove that these forces that have been holding back um, are wrong. Wichita can do better. It will do better. It deserves better. Let's go do it, guys. Thanks. We have the data. We know the looming economic consequences of ignoring the facts. Sometimes the truth is hard to face. But if we dare to dream of what our city could be and accept that changes must occur for us to thrive, Imagine where Wichita will be in 5, 10, 30 years from now. So now, we must all work harder, collaborate more intentionally, and invest in our city at an even greater level. We have the data. Now it's time for action. The Community Foundation has been challenging all of us, all of us as Wichitans, for the last three years to take the four challenges that James Chung put forward and said, go do what you can do to help impact our economy. It's time for the Community Foundation to evolve. It's time for our next step in this process. Um, and today we are sharing with you what that next initiative is going to be. We're committing our single largest financial gift ever today to one single project. And I'm gonna tell you just briefly about it and then um, share a little bit more exciting news with you. So first and foremost, our announcement today is that we are creating a $1 million talent ecosystem fund to support workforce, the development of talent, and to support lifelong learning in our community. We've never been more excited to embark on this work. Um, it's going to be challenging and we, we are up for the challenge. We hope you are too. Um, the exciting part that I'm also here to share with you today is that we are already um, working this fund in the community and as we go out and work with other national funders and other people in the community that are interested in working with us on this project, um, we're gonna be starting our first pilot project immediately. Our first grantee is um, receiving $500,000 to tell you a little bit more about this project is Sherry Utash of WSU Tech. So on behalf of WSU Tech, uh, I really want to thank the Wichita Community Foundation for their insight, their leadership, and for this incredible financial commitment to address some of the issues that we've heard today. This, these dollars will allow us to invest in workforce development and to create some innovative strategies to create the workforce that this community badly needs. You heard from Zach this afternoon. Zach is one of over hun of, of a hundred, hundreds of students that have received the Wichita Promise Scholarship over the last two years. We started this two years ago, and it had four promises to this community. Number one, 
we would take students in and we would pay their tuition and fees that their federal Pell Grant did not cover. Secondly, we would provide them with accelerated training with industry recognized credentials in high wage, high demand, high technology jobs for this community. Number three, we would give them personalized career and life coaching. So not only will they be successful to get the job, but how to keep the job and to grow that workforce. And then fourthly, we guaranteed them an interview with one of our industry partners. Zach is an example of one of the hundreds and hundreds of students that have benefited from the Wichita Promise. So fast forward to today. This $500,000 grant from the talent ecosystem is going to do this for us. We're going to be able to move to the next iteration of Wichita Promise. And it's called Wichita Promise Move, M-O-V-E, Wichita Promise Move. We are going to be able to go out and create some unique strategies to recruit outside of this community and outside of this state and bring people in and give them the four promises that we've done all along, but it also gives us the ability to assist students with relocation packages, with cost of living expenses while they're in training, and maybe even some kind of potential sign-on bonus for this community and for the workforce that it so badly needs. It's a great opportunity to look at a different vein. A lot of people have heard me say there's got to be 25 different veins to fill the artery. This is another way of doing that. But I think it's so important as we sit here today, everybody that's here is here because you love Wichita. We want to this to be the community that we live in, we work in, we raise our families, and we want, fam we want our grandchildren to do the same. We want them to be here. So I just implore you today to accept the information that's been given to us understand and embrace the sense of urgency and to try to collaborate and work together in order to move this city forward. We don't want to be, we want to be better than the Des Moines and the Oklahoma cities and the Cedar Rapids. We can be better and we will be better. We want to be that city of capital opportunity and if we engage in this together with innovative ideas and with determination and a passion and a pride, I believe that Wichita can be that opportunity capital. So I just, you know, my wish for everybody that's here today that's hearing this and that may watch the video, I want you to get up every morning and I want you to think about if you're an individual within the groups that you you know, associate with, within the organizations of which you live and work. Think about every morning when you get up. What can you do to move Wichita forward? Don't be scared. Have faith, not fear. Let's do it. I really want to thank the board, of, the board of the Wichita Community Foundation, Shelley Pritchard, Courtney Bangston. I want to thank them for their leadership, for their vision, and I want to thank them for bringing us to this historical day of challenge. We, we have economic challenges, but let's look at them as economic opportunities. Let's work together to create the Wichita that we all want to know, love, work, and live in. Thank you. Something we've learned at the Community Foundation is you have to be flexible and nimble, be risk takers and experiment, because sometimes when you talk the librarian CEO into letting you have an event before the public space is actually open, <laughs> you learn that everything automatically shuts down at five when the library closes, including the screens. Well, you know what? We still got the message, you're all still here, and we're thrilled that you're here. And we've devised something to help you create your own challenges and solutions for Wichita. So on your way out, pick up a pack of Truth and Dare cards. 
Now we printed 400 sets of these. We may not have quite enough um, given the, the turnout and I just got a picture out there from the overflow area. So if you don't get one tonight, get on our website, sorry Courtney, send Courtney an email <laughs> and, we'll, and we'll, get, we'll, we'll reprint them and get more to you. So on this deck of cards, you will find 20 truths or facts about Wichita. And then you'll find 20 dares to help us solve those solutions and help us tackle these challenges that James has laid out for us. But the most important part is there are, 20, or there are five, 20 challenges, five blank cards for you to create your own because we know you all can do that. And as James told us today, that's what it's going to depend on is all of us creating our own. We hope you'll share these ideas at hashtag I did the dare ICT. So hashtag I did the dare ICT. Follow that along and see what comes. So these solutions that we pre presented today and these folks who've talked, um, that's not all. That's not all of the outcomes from Focus Forward. And it can't be because we won't continue to see our city grow and move in the way that we want it to be. We're going to have to work harder. We're going to have to continue to collaborate and collaborate even more intentionally. And we're going to have to invest at even greater levels in our city to move forward. As we wrap up this part of our work with James, and we really don't know what's going to come next with that, but as we wrap up this part of our work with James Chung, we have the data. He's given us the data to act on. He's given us the challenges. So we have the data. And now it's time for action.